Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. to see how a person can lead a somewhat misguided life as an antiquarian. Uh, it starts rather early, as it turns out. Uh, uh, this picture was taken in the summer of 1957, and I was in between my sophomore and junior years uh, at Amherst College, majoring in physics. I'd met a very fascinating young woman about three weeks before, and she took a picture of me riding the, the uh, bicycle, which I had uh, uh, borrowed from the Amherst Physics uh, Department, uh, uh, Amherst Physics Department, it was up in the attic. Uh, it had a 54 inch front wheel and an 18 inch rear wheel, and I learned how to both ride it and fall off gracefully, uh, uh, and not too painfully. Uh, time passed, and I eventually got my uh, bachelor's degree in physics. Uh, that was on a Sunday. The next Saturday, I married the photographer. Uh, and then we spent our honeymoon in a mental hospital. And then I went off to graduate school. Uh, it turns out that I had married a psychiatric nurse. Um, and so uh, I, I have found that a uh, summer working with sociopaths, psychopaths, uh, schizophrenics, and, and other people like that uh, was a great, uh, a great way to train oneself for uh, uh, a long 41-year uh, career of teaching at a distinguished liberal arts college. Um, Five years later, uh, uh, Rutgers had spat me out as a brand new PhD. Uh, I was the world's leading expert on the thermal conductivity of indium and indium alloy thin films, uh, which is about all I remember of the topic. Uh, uh, then I went off to uh, start teaching at Kenyon, and I discovered the teaching wasn't as easy as it, uh, as it appears. Uh, and so I. Uh, I began to uh, work on lecture demonstrations. I discovered there was a lot of nice looking old stuff uh, in the back room, starting with a telescope uh, that uh, uh, the uh, third Lord Kenyon had given us in 1827. I mean, we're just saturated with stuff like this. Uh, and uh, I really didn't know what it was, uh, but I started to uh, buy old physics books for a dime or a quarter. Uh, in uh, 1975, the uh, Smithsonian asked me to come out and spend spring break, and at that point, uh, I had a total conversion, conversion process. I was Saul on the road to Tarsus. The, uh, the sun uh, shone down upon me, and I said, I believe. Uh, uh, and then I started to visit other colleges and uh, give talks, uh, sort of like this one, though rather less sophisticated, I hope. Uh, and uh, uh, photograph the apparatus in their back rooms. And all of a sudden, I found that I was an expert. Now, you, you have to take this with a certain grain of salt, because I was an expert in a field of one. Uh, but at least it was a, it was a, a nice, tidy, self-contained field. It was anything that I wanted it uh, to be. About 10 years ago, uh, colleges and universities and schools and individuals started to give me apparatus. It started with Overland. Uh, by the way, Overland was the last uh, Ohio college to beat Ohio State. I, I suppose this is a, an important thing. Um, and uh, uh, we started to collect apparatus. At any rate, we have something over uh, 500 pieces of uh, apparatus uh, in the house right now, and uh, uh, four or five pieces actually in our car on the way back. We did a little, little bit of collecting uh, a couple of days ago. and. Uh, the stuff just went all over the house. I think the, uh, the real problem came when Sonny discovered a balance in the uh, bathroom uh, with a tube of toothpaste on one side and my toothbrush on the other side. She said, that is it. And so we added a wing, the eighth different wing, onto our house, uh, which was built in 1857. Um, and this is the inside of the wing. It's 15 by 20 feet. Uh, it has cherry shelving that goes up uh, eight feet. Uh, you can't put books all the way at the top. 
uh, you can't put uh, apparatus all the way at the top, but uh, some of my 450 or so uh, 19th and early 20th century uh, books are up there. Uh, the, the, uh, the telescope is 1880, and we sort of uh, go from there. By the way, uh, uh, on the table in front are a couple of two very curious things. They're lead bells. Uh, and so you take them and you tickle them and they go funk, funk, funk. Uh, but if you soak them in liquid nitrogen, they have rather a silvery sound. It's a, if you haven't done the demonstration here, it, it's something I could, I could recommend to you. And here are just a few other pictures uh, of, of, uh, that were taken in the uh, uh, museum, a very nice induction coil in the front, uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, just some apparatus that I made myself uh, up at the top. Uh, now today I'm going to talk uh, about just two topics. Uh, I'm going to talk about static electricity, and so I call that sparks. And I'm going to talk about uh, devices that were used to dem demonstrate uh, oscillations and wave motion, and that's the wiggles. Uh, so let's start out uh, by going back to the year uh, 1650, and the problem is how do you uh, generate an electric uh, charge? Well, uh, the gentleman you see here is Otto von Guericke, uh, who is perhaps, who is the uh, uh, Burgemeister of the uh, German town of Magdeburg. Uh, Magdeburg is about 75 miles due west of Berlin. And he's probably best known for his demonstration of the Magdeburg hemispheres. These are the two big copper hemispheres. They are, uh, uh, this is a Magdeburgian L, by the way. Uh, uh, and those are 1.2 Magdeburgi L's across, and there are 10 horses on one side and 10 horses on the other side. Uh, it's pumped out, and air pressure keeps the two together. Uh, but for my purposes, uh, he is the person who invented the electrostatic machine. Now, he discovered that if you took your hands and ran them over the surface of sulfur, you got sparks. Uh, and he wanted to generate those sparks continuously. And so what he did, uh, what he needed was a sulfur sphere on a stick like that, so that could be rotated. Uh, and uh, you can't machine sulfur. Uh, and so what he did was to get a glass blower, uh, and the glass blower made him a glass uh, sphere. Uh, and then he melted the sulfur and poured it inside the sphere, let it harden. Uh, and then he cracked off the glass, and he had a sulfur sphere, and he rotated it, and by golly, he got sparks. You could see it in the dark. Uh, then he discovered that you didn't have to crack off the glass. Then he discovered that you didn't need the sulfur at all. You could do perfectly well uh, with uh, just, just the uh, glass. Uh, uh, I just saw a, a T-shirt with a, uh, a, a message with... Uh, if you knew what the answer was, uh, you wouldn't call it research. Do I have that more or less right? <laughs> yes, well, you sort of stumble into these things. Uh, let me show you uh, other geometries that you can use to generate electricity from glass. Uh, this is a disk machine. Uh, uh, it's a 40-inch diameter. There's my wife. Uh, this was made in New York City uh, probably about 1870. And I know that, uh, I know that date is probably true. Uh, because uh, this is in the attic of Vassar College, and Vassar uh, was founded in, I can't remember, 66 or 68, uh, from the estate of Matthew Vassar of Poughkeepsie, New York, who made his money in beer. Um, he was a brewer, uh, and so it wouldn't have been made any earlier than that. Uh, in this device, uh, uh, there's a crank, and the crank uh, rotates the big glass disc. Uh, in 1870, a big piece of glass like that is a non-trivial thing. Uh, right here uh, is a rubber. Uh, the rubber is a horsehair pad. Um, well, actually, it's a leather pad stuffed with horsehair. And then smeared over the surface is a lovely concoction of mercury and lard, uh, sort of a, a lard amalgam. And that turns out to be pretty good at uh, separating electrons. And the electrons then travel on the glass the glass is a dielectric, and so the electrons don't move around. And they're picked off by sharp points right here. Uh, and if this were, were really operating, Sony would be very, very unhappy. <laughs> uh, there are uh, lots of other machines. Uh, I brought this one along uh, just because it's so very big. Uh, this is not a Wimshurst machine. 
Uh, this is called a Tepler-Holtz machine. This is at Fort Hayes State College in uh, Hayes, uh, uh, Can uh, Kansas. And if this is the state of Kansas right uh, here, uh, Hayes is right there. Uh, it's way, way out on the prairies. You can see wheat for as uh, long as you want to look. Uh, this uh, electrostatic machine is what's known as an influence machine, and I'm not going to have time to talk about uh, exactly how that works, except for a case that I'll demonstrate in just a minute. Um, uh, this was used to generate x-rays uh, for uh, a doctor who worked for the railroad. Uh, and this will jump a spark about, uh, oh, 20 inches. Uh, that is, that is a, a, a multiple thousand volt spark. I won't go into the arithmetic there, but it is a very big, beautiful thing. Uh, they don't know quite what to do with it. Uh, they certainly don't want to set it up and produce x-rays all over the place. Uh, this is called an electrophorus. Uh, spelling it would be something like electrophorus. And it was invented about the year 1800 by Alessandro Volta. Uh, and it consists of a, uh, a metal. Uh, plate down here and a sheet of plastic. In this case, this is hard rubber. This was made circa 1900. Uh, and I'm going to electrify that by uh, rubbing it with a piece of uh, rabbit fur, something that my mother picked up in Turkey in the uh, uh, 1970s. Okay. And that should be pretty well charged. And I don't know what charge it is. Let's say that it has a positive charge. Uh, here is a metal plate on an insulating handle. Uh, as I wave this around, I have a feeling I should point there are no rabbits up my sleeves, just, uh, just over there. Uh, and I'm a pretty good reservoir of charge. So this is uh, pretty electrically neutral. Now, I take this and I bring it down close, close to the uh, uh, positively charged cake right here. And this metallic plate has a separation of charge, uh, negative charge, and if I may use uh, 19th century, early 19th century ideas, uh, the, uh, the negative electric fluid uh, goes to the bottom right here, and the positive charge goes to the top. That negative charge is firmly bound by the presence of the positive charge there. I put it down here, it doesn't change anything, but I can take off uh, that uh, positive charge and now this whole thing should be negatively charged. Okay, well, now you don't see a thing. Uh, but if I go to the next slide, which is something else, but let's kill as many lights as possible. Uh, I have here a, uh, a little uh, light bulb. It's not an incandescent light bulb. It's a, uh, uh, a neon-filled light bulb. I think it's a five-watt light bulb. Uh, Okay, uh, we should be able to see some sparks here. There we go. And there is the charge coming on and off this. Well, this isn't the solution to the energy crisis, I can assure you. Uh, but it is true that the charge will stay on here for a long time. Uh, this is now the heating season, and this will uh, start until the snows disappear. Uh, from Ann Arbor, which is about May or something like that. <laughs> things are, things are uh, a little bit easier in central Ohio. Uh, here's another curious sort of electrostatic machine. Uh, this is called a hydroelectric machine. Uh, it was discovered quite by accident in 1845 by a uh, British uh, colliery engineer uh, named William Armstrong. Uh, he was working at a pit uh, in northeastern England, and coal mines leak, they had to be dewatered, and so they used steam engines to pump out the water. Uh, and he discovered that one of the boilers had sprung a leak, and the uh, steam, or maybe I should say the water uh, droplets coming out, were uh, electrified. He got a shock. Uh, and then he started to work on this. Uh, uh, you can see here a nozzle uh, there and a nozzle right there. And the uh, steam, which is a, uh, a clear gas, you can't see steam, comes out and, uh, and the process of going around the corner here 
uh, turns into uh, tiny droplets of water. Now, anytime you run tiny droplets through a small orifice, they become charged. Uh, those of you who have done the milk and oil drop experiment know about uh, taking uh, an atomizer filled with oil and spraying out small oil droplets which have one or two uh, electrons uh, extra or maybe one or two electrons in deficit. Um, that's rather a modest size machine. Uh, actually, I've only seen two of these. Uh, nothing so big. Uh, one of them is at the base of the Smithsonian. It looks like a small pig, about that. And there is one in, uh, in uh, Leiden, in, in Holland. Again, small. This is the frontispiece to Henry Node's Lectures on Electricity, uh, the 1844 edition. Other, other editions aren't nearly so good. Uh, uh, Henry Node was an electrician which is to say that he did electrical research. He, he didn't do electrical wiring. Uh, the name, uh, the word has changed. Uh, and in the center of this is a big hydroelectric machine. Uh, now this one uh, was the biggest one ever built. Uh, it was built in England and it was about seven feet from there to there. Uh, the, there are six stout pillars of glass that hold up the, uh, the uh, boiler. And then the steam comes out here. Uh, and this uh, machine would produce a, a spark that was effectively 40 inches long. That's a meter. Uh, at 10,000 volts per centimeter, do the sums. You really don't want to stick your finger into this thing. Uh, uh, the uh, 40 uh, inches is then uh, uh, split up into a lot of spaces between tinfoil dots uh, pasted on big pieces of glass. And so this thing would spark periodically nodes, lectures on electricity. Well, this is a very fascinating uh, frontispiece. I've given lectures about it. I've written articles about it. Uh, it happens to have 25 uh, different uh, pieces of apparatus and the names of 25 different uh, electricians. Uh, for instance, there is Benjamin Franklin. And of course, he's on a kite. We'll talk about this gentleman later. Uh, up here is a, an electrochemical cell which is busy producing hydrogen and oxygen, oxygen by decomposing water. Uh, we're going to need that hydrogen and oxygen, so hang on to that thought. Um, uh, this is an electromagnet, uh, a very new and exciting thing uh, in uh, 1844. Uh, there are lightning rods going down the side here, and if you think this is fanciful, uh, here is an extremely curious lightning rod. I really don't think you would like to uh, get in contact with this thing. This came from Oberlin College, and I can only think that Oberlin students have a tendency to fall asleep. And this was used to liven them up. Though I will show you another way to uh, uh, enliven students uh, in just a moment. Uh, there are various electrostatic machines here. There's a disk machine. There's a cylinder machine. And right here is a living uh, 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 electrostatic machine. Uh, this is an electric eel. Well, the electric eel, I think, is, is uh, making a comeback. Uh, biological physics has become uh, a rather important uh, field of, uh, of physics. Uh, when I was younger, uh, no one ever talked about biological physics. No one ever talked about uh, uh, an electric eel. But in the uh, middle of, or second half of the 19th century, almost every textbook had a picture of a nasty looking creature like this, uh, typically found in the Amazon. Ah, how do you go about storing the electric fluid? Well, you hold it in a flask. You hold it in the jar. You hold it in a Leiden jar. In the Leiden jar, well, that one has a capacity of about a quart and a half. And indeed, the Leiden jars used to be called uh, 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 capacitors because uh, they have a capacity to hold charge. Um, uh, the year here is 18, uh, 1745. The gentleman is Peter van Buschenbroek, uh, which is a very long uh, Dutch name ending in B-R-O-E-K. Um, and here, uh, static electricity uh, is being generated uh, by friction. 
uh, there is a separation of charge between the hands of the glass. The, gla uh, the uh, charge travels up to this point right here, goes up the chain, travels down this uh, bar, uh, which is uh, a wooden bar, which is conducting. There are some uh, silken ropes up here, uh, which serve as an insulator. And then the electric fluid goes down here uh, and drips into uh, the water right here. Uh, the water is ordinary Dutch canal water. And if you've ever been to Holland, you will know that all sorts of things go into the Dutch canals. Uh, and so this is definitely a conductor. Uh, then there's glass, and on the outside there's a conductor too. Uh, 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 Mr. Van Muschenbroek is getting a little bit nervous about this, and so he's sweating, and there are lots of electrolytes in sweat. And so uh, here we have um, uh, uh, an outer conductor, uh, which is grounded to something which is a large reservoir of charge. And then there's an insulator, that's the glass. And then there's the inner conductor, which is charged. Uh, uh, Peter van Muschenberg is just about to put his finger there. Uh, and as it turns out, the original uh, device has not been preserved, because obviously he dropped it. Uh, he got one hell of a shock. Uh, he said, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take a shock like that for all the, uh, all the kingdom of France. I don't know, what was France worth in, eight, in, uh, in 1745? Quite a bit, but uh, it, it's, it's really a very nasty sort of thing. And of course, we still use capacitors uh, ostensibly for uh, storing charge. Uh, some capacitors get very large. This one is in the Royal Scottish Museum. The capacitor is in front, Sony is in the back. Uh, and this was uh, about that high. Uh, it, uh, the, uh, uh, the value of the capacitance is proportional to the area, uh, the surface area uh, of the conductors, which in this case is quite large. Uh, and it's inversely proportional to the glass, uh, to the thickness of the glass. And that's about as thin as you can make it. And so this thing, uh, when fully charged, is quite lethal. Here's something uh, even on a grander scale. This is a Taylor's Museum, T-E-Y-L-O-R, Taylor's Museum in, uh, in Harlem. Uh, a nice little Dutch town uh, about a half an hour by uh, fast electric train south of uh, Amsterdam. Um, this museum uh, uh, was a, uh, uh, an active uh, repository for scientific apparatus until about the year uh, uh, 1800. And then uh, stuff ceased to be added, and then it became a museum. Now, if you ever go there, and it's a delightful place to go, make sure you go on a bright day, because it turns out there's no artificial lighting. Uh, and everything has to come in through the windows. Uh, Sonny and I, unfortunately, went there in a day when you couldn't see the tulips, because it was dark. And we didn't see much of the apparatus either. Uh, this is a rather a large electrostatic machine made by a man named Culbertson about 1775. And the output of that is being fed into a series of Leiden jars right here. And these are fair sized ones. And all of the inner conductors are connected together. These are connected in parallel. And so uh, this makes a very large capacitor. Uh, the capacitance uh, goes as the area. All of these areas uh, add together. Uh, you probably get uh, several thousand volts across a rather uh, large capacitor. When you discharge it, you get a wonderful bang. That is to say, you get a modestly long but very fat spark. The spark heats the air, and the acoustic overpressure comes to your ear, and you say, ouch. Uh, uh, that sounds like a battery of guns firing which is uh, what people did in the beginning. Uh, and so any connection of electrical elements, uh, be it uh, uh, Leiden jars or uh, batteries, uh, electrochemical cells, is today called a battery. And that is literally where the word battery uh, comes from. Uh, a delightful little demonstration. Uh, all it takes is a student uh, and an insulated, uh, insulated table. Uh, I have, uh, I'm retired now, but I wouldn't do this anymore at Kenyon because our students bring in about $48,000 a year. 
which I find staggering because when I was a freshman at Amherst, it was $1,425, room, board, tuition, fees. And we were all very young in those days, so I mean, <laughs> um, uh, you pro probably want to have a small student because for a given amount of charge, you want to get the voltage up fairly high, uh, and the hair stands on end. Um, it's better if the victim of the uh, uh, experimenter uh, has rather thin hair. Uh, I used to hunt around uh, looking for someone with medium length, freshly washed strawberry blonde hair. Unfortunately, strawberry blonde hair is not a good indicator these days. Um, and so I ended up doing it myself, and my hair can get pretty thin in places. Uh, and I can tell you that all the hair on your all the hair on your body stands up. It is a very curious feeling. Now, if you don't like doing this, which might be a little bit dangerous, you might like to use a doll's head with a human hair wig on an insulating handle. Uh, I have seen three different versions of this in apparatus catalogs uh, of increasing agony. Uh, these are, the heads are about this big. And I have looked at a great number of collections. I've never seen one of these. Uh, and they're in every apparatus collection. And I suspect that uh, after the uh, glass handle right here broke off, uh, the professor took it home for his uh, seven-year-old daughter to play with, and they're all lost. But if you happen to have one of these, or if you find one at a flea market, pay the lady the five bucks, I will give you 10. <laughs> and I'll add it to my collection. And I'll put your name on it, too. This uh, particular demonstration is at Middlebury College in Vermont. Uh, uh, it's about that big. Uh, and it's, uh, it's designed to show that, a, uh, that mercury will travel through wood. Uh, uh, this uh, device is placed on a pump plate. And you pump away, so you get a, a pressure differential of one atmosphere between here and here. Uh, the plug of wood, which is about five inches long, is, is made of oak. And oak, as you know, has long channels running through it. And that pressure differential is, able to, uh, is enough to take uh, the mercury sitting uh, up here and push it all the way through. Well, of course, you're uh, dividing the mercury into small droplets, and they're rubbing as they go through. And so when they get through the bottom, uh, and when they come out the bottom, they're charged. Uh, you typically co collect the mercury in a dish down here because the pump plates are often made of brass and you certainly don't, don't want to amalgamate it. Uh, you get potential differences of several thousand volts and you get a lot of mercury vapor and you get uh, uh, a typical mercury glow. Now people knew about this glow. Uh, if you take a barometer that is to say a, a long tube of glass, about 80 centimeters long, uh, filled with mercury and sitting in a cistern of mercury, uh, the mercury level drops until it's uh, 76 centimeters uh, in height from, from here to here. And then there's some uh, empty space at the top, a uh, so-called Torricellian vacuum. Uh, and that uh, actually has a little bit of mercury vapor in it. Not a great deal, because mercury has a little vapor pressure, which is fortunate for us. Uh, uh, about 1715, the uh, British experimentalist, uh, uh, Henry, uh, William Hawksby, uh, I have the wrong name, uh, the younger at any rate, uh, was carrying a barometer uh, upstairs uh, up a darkened staircase, which is a silly thing to do, really. Uh, but he discovered that as he walked up the staircase, um, the mercury was sloshing around, and the sloshing around uh, caused enough uh, friction electricity, enough tribal, tribal electricity, uh, to produce a, a, a significant voltage. And he could see uh, bright uh, blue flashes at the top of his barometer. This, this, I suppose, is the origin of the mercury vapor lamp. Uh, I don't think OSHA would let us do that demonstration today. They will let us do this one. Uh, this involves an electric egg uh, in which you have a discharge through a gas under controlled conditions. Uh, this particular egg is about that high. It's at Amherst College. It was made by Duke, Duke Rattay, 
uh, of Paris. And I could date it pretty accurately be, uh, to about uh, 1882, because the year before Amherst's uh, very lovely uh, Victorian science building burned down, uh, and then they went and bought all new apparatus. Um, uh, to use this thing, you pump it out uh, through a, uh, we put this onto a vacuum pump, uh, and then you put a couple of thousand volts across there uh, with an induction coil, uh, and, and you get a spark uh, traveling through there. You get an electric current. Uh, the atoms are excited, and if you should happen to put a, a spectrometer on there, you could see uh, distinct wavelengths of light. For instance, if you put, if you put uh, hydrogen in there, uh, you would uh, see four wavelengths. Uh, and, and spectroscopists could measure those to uh, five significant figures. Uh, they didn't know what the numbers meant. Uh, in 1880, uh, a Swiss uh, school teacher in Zurich uh, discovered that you could relate those wavelengths to the numbers three, four, five, and six. I'm afraid this sounds like Sesame Street at this point. Uh, and uh, uh, so we get the uh, famous Balmer uh, equation, uh, which is purely empirical. It it's, has about as much validity as pyramidology. Uh, and then in 1913, a young Dane by the name of Bohr uh, manages to put together an extremely uh, far out uh, theory using some assumptions that no one should ever make and manages to explain this. And, and all of a sudden, uh, that, by the way, is the short history of modern physics right there. Uh, there's a little bit more, but uh, that'll, that'll get you through the hardest parts of it. I, I assume there's no one in the back who's asleep, uh, because uh, this is the time when I want to take that hydrogen and oxygen uh, that we've just separated and put it into this cannon, uh, put a cork in it, and fire it off by putting uh, a spark uh, through the uh, electrodes sticking out here. This particular, uh, and when you do that, you just get a little wisp of water vapor. This particular one is at the Science Museum, or at the museum at the University at Maynooth in Ireland, uh, uh, university that goes back to the uh, uh, last few years of the uh, 18th uh, century, uh, and has a wonderful museum that is uh, almost exactly 50% uh, uh, beautiful physics apparatus at 50% ecclesiastical goods. Well, the Irish uh, have priorities. And finally, and I think this is the last one in electrostatics, uh, a, a rather delightful demonstration that I must say I've never done. Uh, this is called an egg illuminator. Uh, it's, well, you can see how big the eggs are. Uh, it was made in Boston about uh, 1860. And you take the three eggs and you put a couple of thousand volts across them. You do this in a dark room and the eggs light up as the electric current passes through them. And now let's shift over to something completely different. Let's talk about wiggles. Um, I've always been very strongly attracted to oscillations and waves. Uh, about 25 years ago, I established a second semester sophomore course at Kenyon uh, on oscillations and waves. Uh, that serves as an interface between the uh, rather reduced mathematical expectations of the first uh, year and a half. Uh, professor, do I really need to use calculus? Yes, you do. And the uh, uh, upper division uh, courses, Professor, do I really need to use group theory? Yes, you do. Uh, uh, also, when I, uh, when I went to Amherst, uh, I was a freshman in 1955, and we had a very curious curriculum in which almost everything was required. You, you could do that in 1955. And one of the courses uh, was uh, physics and calculus combined, taught by a rather fascinating gentleman by the name of Arnold Ahrens. Uh, and I had done rather well in high school physics, as did most of my classmates. Now, mind you, everybody was taking this course. Uh, and then came the first exam, and I flunked it. And almost all my classmates flunked it, too. Um, and then later on, uh, some of us began to understand the true clue. Uh, the uh, great uh, awakening for me, more bits uh, of uh, being on the Tarsus Road, uh, was when uh, we were told about the reference circle. There is uh, an object 
going around a circle at uniform uh, angular velocity. And up there is a light. And the light is shining down. And you see the shadow. And it's moving back and forth in simple harmonic motion. And this is one way of defining what's uh, uh, called simple harmonic motion. If you were to uh, spread that motion out, it would look like this. It would look like a sine wave. Um, and in the, uh, uh, in, in the talk of the day, I, I understood the metaphor. Uh, I, I could uh, describe the whole thing in words, diagrams. I could even explain it to my roommate. Uh, and therefore, I understood what was going on. Uh, so, when I came to Kenyon in 1964, one of the things I discovered in the back room and very little used was a set of three, uh, three very nice wave machines. Now, wave machines are used to show the properties of uh, uh, transverse waves and longitudinal waves. I'll see, you'll see both of these. And also how you add waves together. Uh, this particular one is designed to demonstrate transverse waves. It was made in Boston uh, about 1860 by Ritchie of Boston. They made four very nice wave machines. Uh, Kenyon has three. Uh, uh, you have the fourth one. I think it's only fair for you to give that to us, I think. <laughs> I'm empowered to take that home if you'd like to. Uh, <clears throat> well, I try. Uh, and uh, there's a crank at the end. When you turn the crank, uh, each one of these sliders moves up and down in simple harmonic motion. Uh, but if you focus on the whole uh, system, you see this uh, uh, array of uh, crests and troughs moving either to the right or to the left, depending on which way you turn the crank. Uh, the mechanism is rather fun. Uh, inside, there are a whole bunch of eccentrics, which are set on uh, a shaft. And each one is turned about 15 degrees or so with respect to its neighbor. And so the, it's, it's a, a cyclical thing. Uh, I've always been fascinated by the fact that uh, there is mass production right here. These are all cast. But on the other hand, this case is a one-off. And uh, I have found places where the carpenter marked out what he was going to do, and it wasn't quite right. So he took the piece of wood, and he turned around and did it the other way. So that's a transverse wave machine. This is called a longitudinal wave machine. And longitudinal waves are very hard for people to understand. Uh, there's a visual problem. Uh, you're receiving uh, 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 longitudinal waves right now via the acoustic signal. Uh, you're getting a series of uh, small, very small uh, overpressures uh, or condensations where the air molecules are close together uh, and uh, rarefactions uh, where the air molecules are far apart. Uh, these machines, as it turns out, are much more tricky to build than, longitude, uh, than transverse machines. What you have is a whole series of these plates uh, which are set onto the shaft at angles. So here's, 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 the, uh, here's the shaft. And uh, there is the plate. And as this goes around, the upper surface wiggles back and forth, wiggles back and forth in simple harmonic motion. And then uh, this piece right here uh, wiggles back and forth, and so does the ball. In uh, the year uh, uh, 1800, Thomas Young, uh, who is best known for the uh, uh, wave theory of light, which I suspect he didn't understand fully, but the wave theory of light published an article in the Philosophical Magazine, uh, the most important scientific journal of its time, on the method of harmonic sliders. Uh, and what he was describing was this device right here. Uh, I'm, I'm amused by this because today this would be published uh, probably in the American Journal of Physics, which is designed for high school teachers and the first year uh, college course. Uh, and what you have here are a bunch of devices that slide up and down. Uh, uh, and then the top is cut in a harmonic curve. When I came to Kenny, I discovered that all of these were numbered in pencil. And I couldn't imagine why until I was doing a demonstration, turned it sideways, and then all of them came out. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, all my feathers are numbered for uh, situations just like this. 
if you know the cartoon. Uh, well, if you take the two uh, uh, waves and line them up and add them together, uh, you get uh, constructive interference. If you have the uh, lower template shift at a half a wavelength to the side, you get destructive interference and you get a straight line. I'm not sure if you can buy one of these to this day, uh, but it certainly is very handy. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pass by on that one. Uh, this is the one that you have in the back room. Uh, this particular one is at the College of Worcester, uh, just north of us, an hour north of us in Worcester, Ohio. Uh, uh, the design is by uh, the first graduate of Amherst College, a man by the name of Snell, Ebenezer Strong Snell, uh, graduated in 1822, and this uh, design goes back to about 1850. Uh, you turn the crank. Uh, the mechanism is uh, similar to ones that I've shown you, and you have a series of uh, uh, compression waves traveling this way or that way. Uh, up at the top, you have a bunch of uh, balls, which when you look at them, uh, trace out a helix like this. Well, today uh, we know exactly what this is all about. This is something known as circular polarization, which is an extremely complicated topic. Uh, uh, it's talked about in junior, se uh, junior senior level uh, undergraduate optics courses uh, with a certain amount of trepidation. Uh, in 1860, when this was made, this was just thrown on the general public, and I'm not sure what kids got of it, except that uh, so the subject of polarization was a fresh, new, hot topic. It was the quark of the day, I suppose. Uh, and so people said, ah, I have seen circular polarization, really not knowing exactly uh, what it is. Uh, this cut is from the 1909 Central Scientific uh, Company catalog. Uh, and when you turn the crank, uh, these plates move up and down. You get a nice transverse wave. Uh, uh, but attached uh, to these are extenders. And as you move these up and well, let me show you what happens here. Uh, the next slide, I think, was designed to be blank. Uh, yes, with the idea that I could hold something up, and I certainly am not going to be able to do that here. Uh, but here is uh, the modern device. Uh, you can buy this from the Central Scientific Company uh, for $49.50. Uh, I will take orders if you wish. I could recommend this uh, to you. It's uh, very good for shadow projection. Uh, turns out this is made in India. And the Indians have been making this particular device without any change since 1909, which is very handy. Uh, and so if you look at this end right here, and let me put a white backdrop right here, uh, and I turn the crank, you can say that, see that each one of them wiggles up and down in simple harmonic motion about an equilibrium position. But the spacing between them uh, slides up and down. And so you can see waves going up and down. A very nice toy. Uh, do not have the University of Michigan shop build this. This is, this is something that you can get cheap. Uh, and it works very well. The finish, the finish is pretty good. I could recommend it to you. Uh, that's the end of the serve. I once wrote a review of that, uh, just for the fun of it. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Nathaniel Bowditch, who was in full cry from about 1785 to roughly uh, 1820. Uh, Bowditch to this day is prob uh, probably known best by Bowditch's practical navigator. Bowditch came from Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, which by the 1780s had gotten over the witchcraft unhappiness of about 100 years ago. By the way, the husband of one of the witches was named Thomas Greenslade. Uh, and he's clearly a relative. I mean, you can, you can trace people back to North Devon in England and so on. Uh, 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 but Salem uh, uh, is also known for uh, sending out whalers uh, to get uh, uh, whale oil. And he. Uh, he was, he was a navigator. Uh, he was very good at mathematics. And so he wrote uh, a book uh, explaining exactly how you do navigation, reduced everything to uh, step by step, uh, uh, to a step by step organization. 
And the U.S. government now prints this, and you can get a copy from the uh, feds, a uh, new copy every single year. So this book has been, been a continuous publication for something like 215 years. He no longer gets royalties for this. Um, uh, he's well known for other things. He was uh, uh, the first American actuary. He could, he could predict when either you or your cart would die, uh, so you could insure them, except if you have the one hoss shea, and you know the story of that, where it all fell apart at one time. Um, uh, he started the American insurance industry, and uh, somewhere in his career, probably about 1820, he was wise enough to turn down the presidency of Harvard, which seems like a good idea uh, now. Maybe it was quite so uh, horrible a job then. Uh, and he was also the first American uh, mathematician of note. Uh, in 1815, he published an art article in the American Journal of Science, uh, which was... Uh, uh, published uh, at Yale University uh, and was widely read in the United States and uh, very, very rarely uh, across the Atlantic. Uh, and he wrote a paper called On the Motion of a Pendulum Suspended from Two Points. Uh, and here is a picture from his uh, a diagram. Uh, uh, up here is a, a ceiling, a roof, and this is a string, and that is a string, and that is a string, and that's a construction line right there. And if you set this pendulum uh, wiggling back and forth in the plane of the screen, uh, because it has this uh, bifiler to string uh, support, uh, uh, this point stays at rest, and the effective length of the pendulum is from there to there. On the other hand, if you set this oscillating back and forth perpendicular to the screen, the effective length of the pendulum is from there to there. Now, the uh, period of a pendulum, the time necessary to go through one excursion, uh, is a function of how long the pendulum is. Uh, it's proportional to the square root of the length of the pendulum. Uh, and if you uh, arrange this so that one of those oscillations takes twice as long to complete as the other, you get a two to one Bowditch figure. And here are a whole series of them. Uh, these, by the way, were figured out mathematically. Nowadays, of course, we would do the experiment. Uh, we'd have that pendulum swinging back and forth. Uh, there'd be a little bucket there filled with sand, and we'd follow the sand as it dribbled out. And we, we or some people use shaving cream, works rather well. Uh, and, uh, but he never thought of that. He was a mathematician. Is there a mathematician present? Have I offended you? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, these show what happens when you have a two to one frequency ratio or period ratio using various uh, phasings. Uh, unfortunately, uh, no one ever seemed to, no one ever seemed to uh, pick this up on the other side of the Atlantic. Even this bifilar pendulum uh, which was picked up by, by the name of Blackburn in 1844, so it's known as a, a Blackburn uh, pendulum. Um, but in 18, uh, 1857, uh, a Frenchman by the name of uh, Lissajou uh, published a paper called Note on the Optical Study of Vibratory Motions. And he used a device like this. Uh, this is from a French textbook uh, Gano, which uh, was translated into uh, English and was in print from about 1855 to about 1910, a good long run. Um, uh, I often worry about the, uh, first the scale, this is too large in these French diagrams, but also the rather dissipated look of these fellows who were doing the experiments. At least he could have combed his hair. But, uh, and so over here we have uh, a piece of high tech uh, uh, optical uh, material. This is a, uh, an Argand burner, A-R-G-A-N-D, uh, which is about as good a burner, as, as efficient a burner as you can get for burning whale oil. This is what's used in lighthouses. Uh, and uh, a beam of light comes out and it bounces off one tuning fork right here. Uh, the tuning fork has a mirror on the end and that causes the uh, reflected beam right there to bounce up and down in simple harmonic motion. 
Not very much, but a little bit. And then it bounces off the second mirror and it's caused to wiggle at right angles. Well, this is just what you need for, this is your figures. You need an oscillation this way and an oscillation uh, perpendicular to it. And the result of, uh, is, uh, which is traced out, is the Lissajou figure. Uh, the motion uh, is pretty small, the light is pretty weak, you need a light gathering device, and so you're using either a microscope or a telescope, depending on how it's set up, to look at this. And you could have a lot of fun with these, and I have over the years. Uh, you all know about the uh, uh, kaleidoscope invented by David Brewster uh, way back in 18. 25. I've had a lot of fun recently with big kaleidoscopes. I use uh, one foot by four foot mirrors. Uh, and you can really do some heroic things uh, with mirrors that large. Uh, not the usual things that you go like this. Uh, a couple of years later, a young man by the name of Charles Wheatstone, uh, who later uh, is thought to have invented the Wheatstone Bridge. It turns out he didn't. Uh, but that's another lecture which I'd be delighted to give you, but not now. Uh, and divide, uh, developed a device known as a kaleidophone versus kaleidoscope. Uh, and this is a kaleidophone from about 1900. Uh, it's at the Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. And what you have are a bunch of rods, some uh, rectangular, some, some square, some circular, some oval. And these, uh, depending on their shape, uh, will wiggle this way and wiggle that way. Uh, if you have one that has twice the width as it has the thickness, it goes this way uh, twice as rapidly in time as it goes this way. And so the tip traces out a Lissajou figure. You can't see that easily. And so what uh, you do is take a bright light source right here and uh, uh, reflect the light from it. You put your eye up there and you can see lovely figures. Uh, and the figures uh, can often be very beautiful. I, I have built one of these. It's simply a long uh, piece of uh, stout music wire. The end is polished smooth. It's held in a vise. I'm in a dark room, bright light over there. I bounce it with my finger, and I get uh, curves that look like this. Uh, if I uh, hit it rather gently, I might get curves that look like this. But if I really whang it, uh, I would get fancy curves like this. Uh, and uh, these, by the way, come out of Tyndall's uh, uh, book on sound from 1860. And I thought they were sort of fanciful until I built this device. Uh, it took me about 25 minutes. And discovered that they really are true. Very, very pretty things. Uh, and let me go back one here. Um, because it's possible to make one of these devices very, very cheaply. Uh, here is uh, a piece of high-tech apparatus. Uh, that happens to be a two by four. Though I did run it through the planer to smooth it up a little bit. And this is the physicist's friend. This is a piece of coat hanger wire. Uh, and there is a small mirror, a small plastic mirror that's put on a, a piece of dowel and then fastens on the end right here. And this thing will wiggle up and down and it will wiggle from side to side. Ah, this is your figures. And let's get this thing wiggling now. With luck, I will be able to bounce this off the far wall. Uh, and so, there it is. And I seem to be doing this on somebody's head right now. Uh, so I would like to lift up one end just a tad. Uh, will a student newspaper mind if I rip off a corner right here? I'm sure people are always ripping off the student newspaper. Uh, and let me tilt this up. There we go. Uh, and I'll try to avoid you as much as I can. <laughs> there we go. Very pretty. Um, if nothing else, it's fascinating to cats. They'll, they'll play with that for hours. <laughs> Uh, this ought to be in the repertoire of the uh, uh, physics demonstration room here. Well, now let's talk about this device up here. Uh, this is known as a harmonograph. I first saw one of these sitting by itself in the physics library at Amherst in the fall of 1957, and I was entranced by it. I've built uh, any number of devices like this since then. Uh, this is a pendulum harmonograph. Um, 
And what it has are two pendulums, which are vibrating at right angles to each other. Uh, those are the uh, knife edges uh, on which the uh, pendulum oscillates, and you can see they're at right angles to each other. Uh, and so the paper wiggles back and forth uh, in some harmonic motion. Um, you keep the amplitude small, so it's still a simple harmonic motion. And the pen, ballpoint pens are just wonderful for this after they've been broken in. Uh, gel point pens are, are the very best. And this wiggles back and forth, so we get two oscillations at right angles to each other. And what's traced out on the paper uh, looks something like this. Uh, here, uh, th this is a damp system, so it runs down with time. So this starts on the outside and runs down to the center like that. It starts out with a phase difference close to uh, zero degrees, maybe 10 degrees. If you're old enough, this also might remind you of a 78 RPM uh, record, <laughs> of which I think I have about 1,800 in the house. My wife recently discovered one of my caches. <laughs> uh, if you start out with the two oscillations at uh, right angles to each other and 90 degrees out of phase, you get something like this, and this eventually curves in until it gets down to the center right there. Uh, the day I made this, I, I felt playful, and so I put one of these on top of another, and I got nice moiré patterns, M-O-I-R-E, named after, uh, it's a French word for watered silk. Two patterns, two uh, patterns of uh, lines laid uh, on top of each other with fairly small angles uh, between them. Uh, you can make uh, even more complicated devices. Uh, this is a double pendulum harmonograph. And this, by the way, is the last thing I'm going to talk about. But I would like to uh, uh, tell you just a little bit about how this is made. Uh, what you need is a, a universal joint. And uh, I once made a couple of very nice ball bearing universal joints. Uh, and one would be up there, and one would be down here. By the way, this picture is from the 1914 uh, copy of the Boy Mechanic. I, I use all sorts of things in my work. Uh, uh, and so here is a pendulum suspended right here, and it flops around. And there's a lot of weight right here. Uh, there are maybe 10 kilograms of iron uh, up there at the top where it says G. And then there's another universal joint down here, and more weight. And this thing just sort of flops around. And it's very complicated to do uh, uh, mathematically, though I suppose with a computer it's a piece of cake. Uh, and then as it flops around, uh, the motion uh, is traced out with a pen. And I'm going to conclude by just showing you some of these that I've drawn over the years. Um, these curves are truly chaotic. Uh, and I'm using chaos in the uh, conventional modern way, not to indicate randomness, but to indicate that the curves are, are completely determined once you know the initial conditions. But a little change in the initial conditions produces an entirely different curve. Uh, and these uh, are damped curves, so they slide in toward the center. And you see some moiré patterns as, as the uh, lines start to intersect. And uh, very complicated ones. It seems to have a mind of its own as it goes around. Well, I thank you very much. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program.